I've been rather clairvoyant on a lot of the things we discuss. I just tend to be 15 years too early. Welcome to episode 71 of Farm to Markets. Today we are talking about the British healthcare system, short selling companies, and more lightning round questions at the end. The British healthcare system prided itself on being one of the leanest healthcare systems in the developed world, spending less per head on average than its European neighbors and far less than the US. Now the state funded service is falling apart. People who suffer from people who suffer from heart attacks or strokes wait more than an hour and a half on average for an ambulances. Hospitals are so full that they're turning patients away. A record 7 point, or 7.1 million people in England, more than one in 10, are stuck on a waiting list for non-emergency hospital treatment like hip replacements. Uh, the, the National Health Service, or the NHS, on Monday uh, faced the biggest strike in history with thousands of paramedics and nurses walking out over pay. Uh, what uh, do, you know, how did it go from being like one of the, the crowning jewels of the, uh, the British government to this? All right. So um, my my take on this one is um, go back in time about 60 years and look at the demographic pyramid of the United Kingdom. And fast forward to today and look at the demographic pyramid of the United Kingdom. Uh, what's what's happening to the NHS is the future of basically every welfare system in basically every developed country that can't figure out how to get money without having people. So you go from 60 years ago, having a lot of workers and a few people who are retired and receiving benefits from like the NHS in retirement who, you know, what, the older you get, the more health care you tend to need. And well, now all of a sudden you have a pretty inverted demographic pyramid. You've got a lot of people receiving benefits in their older age and not nearly as many young people as a percentage of the population working in those hospitals and in those doctor's offices and everything else to support these people. But meanwhile, the NHS is a government run system. So they don't want to pay through the nose uh, like you might have to in a more free market system where you have more demand, fewer supply, the price of doctors, treatment, et cetera, goes up, up, up. Well, they don't want that. Um, so what's happening is, again, like I said, you have a lot more people who need who need care, fewer people to provide it as a percentage of the population and a government that doesn't want to pay them any more than they used to. So now you've got a strike. Um, I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon, even if they manage to put a bandage over it. What they desperately need is a lot more young doctors and nurses and paramedics and everything else, and they're not getting it. And you know, after decades of immigration from their former colonial empire, which is largely brought, not not entirely, but largely brought a lot of like uneducated and unskilled immigrants to fill out like low level jobs in society. It has not really been able to plug the gap in those mid and high skill, high wage jobs, uh, particularly in healthcare. And so now we have the NHS basically imploding. So hopefully that... <laughs> Hopefully, I guess for the people of the UK, they get it figured out, but uh, I don't know how they will in, in the near term. Mm -hmm. So what, what I think is happening um, with, with the NHS in Britain and, um, well, probably a lot of other countries, by the way, is they took a healthcare system, which desperately needs competition and, and privatization in order to continue to thrive and improve in the long term. And they artificially made it look good by creating this socialized healthcare system. Uh, Britain and, uh, and uh, Canada, certainly, um, probably a little more close to home, they're right over the border. They've been touting their free healthcare systems all these years, but the reality is their healthcare systems are artificially propped up on this allure of having these universal and, um, and cheap healthcare systems. Now, it's, it's been said before, you can have three attributes in healthcare. You can have affordability, you can have quality, and you can have universality. So it can be, um, it can be cheap, uh, good, or it can be um, for everyone. Now, you can only have two of those things. Um, three is a unicorn. It doesn't exist anywhere in the marketplace. Um, so with the UK, um, they had a system that was cheap and universal, but it ends up being clogged. Um, and people end up waiting months for surgery. And that's what's happening over there. The quality is just not there. Um, think about it. Why would you want to be a doctor in a system that mandates how you practice medicine and decides how much you can make in your practice when you can make more with less regulations somewhere else, um, almost like the United States. Um, so the UK is having a shortage of doctors and the quality 
and the system is collapsing on itself. And by the way, a lot of citizens are coming to the United States to have their elective surgeries. Um, now, it's more expensive here, but that's the price you pay for having those services on demand. I think a system that would thrive better um, or not collapse on itself like in Britain or Canada is one that's cheap um, and good. The quality is there. And the marketplace would probably naturally fill those gaps of the affordability, I would think. Um, I'm not saying our system is perfect, um, far from it probably, but I think um, a country that operates on a 100% privatized uh, system uh, is, is bound to fail. The vast majority of the employees that work at Cocoa Enterprises are involved in free market medicine. In other words, is that uh, we pay um, exactly what the healthcare costs, and we tend to do that through mutual aid, through voluntary cooperation with other people of like mind. It's not quite insurance. It's more like a bunch of friends or a church uh, family getting together and sharing each other's costs. As a result, the free market gives us incredible savings because doing business with free market uh, healthcare uh, folks is a lot easier than doing it through a government system. And uh, um, I first went on to social media in 2010, and I remember arguing with somebody from Great Britain online about how wonderful the NSS program was. She was like saying, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Everybody has, you know, has access to it. It doesn't cost any money. Um, uh, it's, the quality is fantastic. And I said, not for long. At some point, you're going to hit the end of the credit card, and that's exactly what has happened. Um, why was it so touted and, and so well received years ago? It's because the credit limit on the credit card was just starting several years ago, but now we've hit the credit limit, and what's happening is that they can't afford the program. Uh, unlike free market medicine, the way uh, government healthcare works is that legislators sit down and they say, "Okay, we're going to spend two trillion dollars on healthcare." this year. That's the budget. But they have contracts to pay healthcare providers a certain amount of money. If more people get sick or need healthcare than what was allocated for, there's going to be a shortage and there's zero elasticity or flexibility in the program. One of the nice things about free market is that it tends to react very, very rapidly to supply and demand changes in the marketplace. The NHS just can't do that. Um, this is a harbinger of where our program is going in the future with Medicare and Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act, because there will come a time where we also can't afford to uh, uh, to fund these things. And we are so inflexible with all the overregulation that it's going to implode. Those individuals who are already participating in free market health care, we're in a pretty good position because we already have relationships with our doctors. Mm -hmm. Right. For, for the government, it's a it's a budget issue is that you t I think it was 10 years ago, they decided to making, uh, you know, trying to reduce uh, their, their deficit spending. And a lot of that came with cuts to the NHS. And you know, it takes seven years to produce a doctor. But over that seven years, people saw that doctors aren't getting doctors and nurses and paramedics aren't getting you know wage increases that match uh, the rate of inflation. And generally, like the quality of, you know, the the job satisfaction in being a doctor or a nurse or a paramedic for the NHS slowly declined and less and less people are like, you know what, I'm not going to do years of school um, so that I can work for, you know, what was, you know, maybe $120,000 10 years ago, you know, maybe I'm working for like $80,000 today and people are going to like sue me and, you know, put all this liability on me. It's just not worth it. And so if, if, the British government wants to increase the quality of their health care, they either have to privatize it or they have to spend more money on it. And if, if they don't want to go deeper in the debt, they have to you know, basically make the same decisions that any household budget would have to make. And be like, what, what other things are we going to cut? Because you can't give everybody everything. You can't give out energy subsidies when things get rough if you can't pay for your health care. So somewhere they got to decide in their budget where where's the money going to come from to increase the quality of healthcare services, or they just got to let it go all together. So I'd be interested to see how, you know, what decisions they make here in the next couple of years. All right. Uh, all right.
right, so uh, Nathan Anderson, the founder of Hindenburg Research, released a report on January 24th accusing uh, the um, <clears throat> Adani group of a brazen stock manipulation and accounting fraud. Hindenburg seeks out, so Hindenburg is what they call like a research company, and basically what they do is they seek out companies that it believes have lied about their business or misled investors. The most high profile case that the Hindenburg research company has been a part of was uh, calling out Nikola for rolling that truck downhill when Nikola said it works, but really they, they rolled it down a hill, turned the camera on its side, and made it look like it works. So Hindenburg Research was a company that called them out and then shorted the stock and made a bunch of money. Now they're trying to do that with the Adani Group. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the companies like Hindenburg Research, you know, shorting companies like this and then like publicly calling them out? I, I don't really have any issue. It seems like the market should be thanking companies like this for, you know, revealing fraud on the part of companies that investors may be putting their money into. Um, I... Uh, you know, in, in a more like broad sense, I don't think if there's any like legal prohibition against companies, you know, shorting, you know, research companies shorting a stock that it thinks is defrauding investors, you know, as, as, as long as they're not blatantly telling the public's public the exact opposite, I don't really have any issue. Um, so, you know, th if there's any regulation in place, it would be that, you know, yeah, you probably shouldn't be able to short a stock and then tell everyone you love it. Um, but uh, beyond that, yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, nice to see companies out there um, looking for bad actors and telling people about it. I, I agree with you, Alex. Um, I, I'm not a, a fan of investing short myself, nor nor is Coco Enterprises, uh, just for the compliance record, in case anyone uh, ever listens to this. Uh, I am, however, a big fan of, of, like Alex said, the freedom of other investors to take short positions in those companies and, and find those bad actors. So it's reflected in the information in the marketplace. The market operates efficiently on information that moves fast. So when investors know something about a company, either good or bad, uh, information that's that is made public is reflected in the share prices and that only helps um, the, uh, the investors. Sorry. So, um, it, but the thing is, it, you can tell if a company is uh, is shorted heavily or not. It's called the short float ratio. So whenever you buy a stock, you should do your due diligence. You can tell if a, if a stock um, is like 50% short and that should give you a good indicator of, uh, of whether you should buy it or not. I, I, I like the idea of investing up optimistically i want to invest in a company that's rewarded for their good behavior not invest in a company that's punished for their bad i i, I like the counterparty um outcomes of of, of hindenburg doing these sorts of things because i because i do believe it it forces demons to act like angels even when they don't want to um the, the, the one area where i have a little bit of concern is that is it can can they make more money seeking out companies that are doing nefarious things and then shorting them or would they make more money um working with nefarious companies to come out with uh research which says the exact opposite and people uh, uh end up doing things they ought not to do I, I i'm creating imaginary horribles in my head here but uh i think in concept i like the idea of the free market providing their own party counterparty surveillance i i certainly like it much much more than having a government regulate regulatory firm which has already proven that it can't be trusted in many cases to give us the right information. <clears throat> yeah, it's like the free market version of the SEC. And exactly, I, you know, I think Bill Ackman did this with Herbal Life um, a number of years ago, where he tried to say something bad about Herbal Life, and I think Herbal Life ended up suing, uh, you know, Bill Ackman, and I think they won. Like I can't remember the details off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure Bill Ackman tried to do something like this with Herbal Life. And then got in a bunch of trouble for it because Herbal Life was like, "That's not true," and then they proved it. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what happened. And if you know the Adani Group is actually doing what they they say they are, you know, they should just you know lay it out there and let people see it. But I have no problem with with companies being like, "Hey, we have this research because it worked really well in the Nikola case." You know, they they spotted that. I don't know what exactly they did or how they got the uh, got the information, but but. They're right, and you know the the truck did not work. So I'm I'm all for uh, stuff like this going on. Yeah, Bill Ackman actually lost a lot of money in a short position on Herbalife, which right. it, it's not. 
that's not a, a an unhappy ending to a story. It's just hey, the they weren't doing anything wrong, and yeah, they they and if Herbalife is able to defend it, because I mean, you you have to you have to be pretty convicted to do this if you're going to put you know a lot of money behind it. So I mean, either you got really bad information and the people you trusted probably lost their jobs, or you know, or you have a really good reason for for putting forward that information. So either way, is that you got to have a lot of conviction to say it because you're gonna you, you could lose a lot of money. All right, let's uh, go into lightning round. All right, so the, the U.S. has uh, shot down several objects out of the sky over the past two weeks. I'm sure people have been following this. The U.S. officials have said they know the most about the first one, which they have described as a Chinese spy balloon outfitted with equipment to collect intelligence and communications. The other objects are still somewhat of a mystery. What do you think is going on? Uh, so I'll try and be quick on this. Uh, what I've read on it um, is that uh, obviously they look like they're surveillance balloons. Uh, what the, what exactly they're looking for still still kind of indetermined. But uh, what it seems like is that they exist kind of in a gray area where it's pretty easy to track satellites and it's pretty easy to track like spy aircraft and stuff like that. But pretty low profile and small objects on radar that move pretty slowly seem to uh, be difficult to track unless you crank up the radar's you know sensitivity or you don't filter out these low profile objects. Um, when you when you turn them up, when you turn the sensitivity up on, on like radar systems, apparently you can pick up like flocks of birds or hailstorms and stuff like that. Uh, so it seems like they're trying to exploit this little little gray area in what what you know North American radar systems would track and uh, now that they're looking for them they're seeing them all over the place um, I think it was James Mattis former defense secretary who said that they spotted a few of these during the Trump administration over North America um, so it doesn't seem like it's a new phenomenon it just seems like the public has finally become aware of them because i guess at least one of them got low enough that everyone could take pictures of it with their cell phones um and uh so now i guess china's spy balloon program is front and center and uh they're not too thrilled about that i guess so we were talking about this over the water cooler the other day and uh, i tend to agree with um with, with what uh, you think, Dad, so I'm not going to steal your thunder. So I'll Thanks. just say that I, I, I think we're living in a, uh, a men in black scenario, and these are all actual UFOs, but they're doing the flashy <laughs> thing to us and telling us that these are weather balloons filled with swamp gas, and until they uh, you know stop flashy thinking us, um, we, we, we're, we're just not going to know. It's, it's going to be up to whatever they tell us. I, I think it's more of a PSYOP operation with the Chinese who are probing us, not so much our national defenses, but our, our, our will to defend Taiwan if the Chinese decide to invade. Uh, one of the things that Americans have incredible hubris and, uh, uh, and arrogance about our, our technology uh, uh, in, our, in our war fighting, and what the Chinese are doing is they're probing us with incredibly low tech technology saying, look, you guys, <laughs> you guys can't even fight weather balloons. Um, uh, what makes you think, America, that your 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 military is going to be able to defend uh, against a, an attack on Taiwan? So, I, I think they're they're testing the social media and all the uh, all the, uh, the the chatter that's taking place on social media to get a feel for what the United States will do if if China is serious about invading and taking back Taiwan. Uh, you know, there's been some allegations that the U.S. also has spy balloons, uh, which I, I don't know if are, are true or not. But if that is the case, you know, because a lot of this, you know, I listen, you know, I've listened to a couple of Joe Rogan podcasts where they had some guy that was sp supposedly like an ex spy or something like that, saying that you know the Chinese have been bugging you know U.S. cell phone towers for for years, and they've had trouble replacing those parts with all the Chinese like spyware in it, and it sounds like the, the U.S. and China are probably go back and forth quite a bit on spying on each other. Maybe I've just read too many spy books, but this might be just a case where it's like, all right. Uh, you stinkers! You, you got us! You you found our spy balloon, and now we're going to shoot them down. And you know the Chinese, if they find our spy balloon, if we even use those, are going to shoot them down. It's just like in chess when you trade queens. It's like, all right, you know, we got your queens. Now we're playing without you know queens. In this case, we're just we're playing without spy balloons now. You know, you got to figure something else out. That might be it too. I I, I don't know. Maybe I just read too many spy books. <laughs> 
All right. Um, so Charlie Munger wrote uh, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal on February 1st, basically saying that cryptocurrency should be banned. Uh, it wasn't very low. Did, uh, what did what, you think of it, Alex? Uh, as far as whether or not it should be banned outright, uh, I, I, I really don't know. To to a large extent, I'm I'm uh, I'm in the camp of you know if people want to spend their money on something, so be it. Um, I don't think for, like outright fraud or anything like that should be legal. Like, but at at what point is something fraud versus just a really bad idea? You know, so. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with banning it outright, um, though most of his criticisms of it I do agree with. Um, there, there does seem to be an emerging use case for crypto and NFTs that I don't think many people are thinking about yet, which is it seems to be a vehicle for capital flight from authoritarian governments. Uh, so one of the main reasons why the Chinese have continually cracked down on it is because every time they try and open up their financial system a little bit, people pour a trillion dollars out and try and buy real estate in the Pacific Rim or farmland in the Midwest or whatever. So they're trying to find ways to get their money out of town. And, uh, you know, if, if they put a million dollars into a bored ape NFT or something like that, and then sell it for $500,000 to some rube in New York. Well, guess what? They got half a million dollars out of China. So I, I think crypto's use case is largely going to be that for now. But um, for the most part, I, I, I agree with his lar largely with his criticisms that it's not really money. It's not really an investment. It's not an asset. You can't really do anything with it. Banning it outright, eh, I, I, at this point, I probably don't agree. Yeah, I, I agree with Charlie Munger's um, criticisms on on crypto. I don't think it should be banned. Um, he, he describes it as gambling or being a casino. Um, if if we're going to ban crypto, we ought to ban casinos and horse races and, um, and Beanie Babies and Pokemon cards. So I don't think um, we should ban those things. It's just that's the nature of them. They're gambles. I, I agree with the gentleman so far who, who, who commented. I, I don't think we should ban it. Um, I think that people should strongly consider personal banning it. Like I personally won't buy it, but I think the idea of uh, making other people not buy it is, is a mistake. If anything, what we should do is we should make sure that uh, the, the governments, when they regulate financial institutions of which they back up the FDIC, they better make sure that all of the financial institutions that they regulate aren't buying this garbage because that's what got us in trouble in 2008 was that the regulators were allowing people to buy garbage at the financial institutions it wasn't the individual joe on the on the street who was buying these goofy uh, you know collateralized mortgage obligations it was the large banks it was the merrill lynch's and, and and the wall street firms and the federal government was allowing them to buy it and then when the whole house of cards fell the regulators were stand saying well we didn't understand it, it was too complex um, so uh, I, I don't think individual investors should be banned from buying it. But uh, if you're going to regulate companies where you're backing up your financial institutions with taxpayer money, for sure, those people should be banned from buying garbage. Same thing. Uh, you know, he was basically preaching to the choir. You know, I was getting ready to hang that article on my office wall right up to the point where he's like, this should be banned. I was like, whoa, you know, you've gone too far for me, Charlie. And that's where I lost my interest. But uh, yeah, good article right up until he gets that. I think that was like pretty much the last <laughs> paragraph and I didn't like it at that point. All right, last question. So a studyfinds.com did a, did a study obviously, and they found that the happiest jobs in order are number one, physical therapist, number two, firefighter, number three, teacher, number four, teaching assistant, and number five, quality assurance analyst. Uh, do you agree with those top five uh, happiest jobs? Do you think that list is accurate? <clears throat> well, I, I don't really have any reason to, dis to disagree. I mean, uh, they all sound like jobs where you're directly helping people, maybe except for like quality assurance. Yeah. Like, you know, you're checking whether or not the, you know, the mugs that are going in the, in the packaging aren't cracked or something. I guess that makes people happy. But uh, the rest of them seem like you're directly helping people and you get immediate feedback from those people with how happy they are. So I, I guess I believe the list. I, 
I, I think there's exceptions to each, you know, individual case of the uh, the overarching job. I, I know happy th physical therapists. I know um, um, unhappy physical therapists. Are you the owner? Are you just a worker? Are you a firefighter in, uh, uh, you know, New York City? Or are you a firefighter? You know, so there's... It, like Alex, I have no reason to disagree with it. Um, it's probably interesting to uh, to see the actual um, uh, uh, poll they did, but um, I'm really happy in this industry. I think this is a great job. I don't know why this isn't on the list. I, the, the quality assurance uh, officer that, that that's kind of an outlier. I, I, I never would have saw that one coming. Uh, the other ones, I certainly I certainly do. Uh, it's not easy to be a firefighter. It's not necessarily easy to be a physical therapist. Um, so the way you keep people out of those two things is that uh, you make the training so difficult that people drop out of lines that only a few people can do it. Uh, school teacher, um, I think that the way they keep that down is with the um, salaries. The salaries really are not commensurate with what the work they do. But because the work is so um, fulfilling, people are willing to do it for almost nothing. And that's kind of why teachers get paid less is because their job is so self-rewarding. I can see everything except for quality assurance analysts because I'm pretty yeah. sure if you worked for the Boeing company in the last 10 years, those are the people they're like threatening on their lunch breaks. It's like, you know, you go to somebody and hey, hey there's a ladder that's going to obstruct the, uh, you know, the corkscrew that controls the thing in the back of the plane that causes it to go up and drown. And they're like, shh, no, there's not. You can break your kneecaps <laughs> if you yeah. tell anybody. So I would say quality assurance analysts would definitely be on the bottom of the list. Um, I was surprised they see that out there. Yeah. Unless they like threaten a bunch of them or just like, you know, like, do you like your job? And they're just like, yep, you know, I don't know. That was the one maybe that- they're like, Maybe they're sadists or something, you know, they really, really like going in and saying, hey, that, that plane component, yeah. you really screwed that up. Yeah. And then laughing but, at them or something. No, I, I, I think that they just pulled everybody, all the quality assurance analysts at Boeing um, and this study is probably from like five years ago when they're all getting threatened and they had to check that box. So that's, that's how I think that. Mm. All right, that's it for uh, episode, 70, episode 71 of Farm to Markets. We'll see you next time.